Welcome back to Storytime. I wanted to give you guys a brief timeline just so you can put everything in perspective as to what we've been talking about this semester. Um, so these are some events that we've already covered. And in our last video, we talked about Rome versus Vei, which as you can see is a roughly, you know, like 100 years after the Republic was formed. And then of course we talked about Brennus, the Senones, and how they burned down Rome. That was in the year 387. And of course the trial of Capitolinus and all that good stuff. So, um, moving on from there, the first date that we're going to talk about today is the year 376 BCE, and here are, just based on some of your feedback from the last video, here are th some names of people that we're going to talk about, so you can go ahead and write them down, get the spelling right. So the first guy that we're going to talk about is this guy, Marcus Fabius Ambustus. He is a patrician that is liked by the plebeians as well, because he's just sort of a generous spirit, a generous soul pretty magnanimous person. He had two daughters, Fabia number one, Fabia number two. Now Fabia number one was married to a patrician, and Fabia number two was married to a guy named Gaius, like, well, in Latin, Licinius Stolo, but we, we call him Licinius. And uh, he's a plebeian who has political ambitions. And remember that uh, after the Lex Canulia, patricians and plebeians could get married. And then uh, we're going to talk about this guy too, Lucius Sextius. He's a plebeian who also has political ambitions. So guys, sometimes it's like the smallest little events that occur that end up years later causing massive social change. And that's what happened in this instance. So Fabian number one's husband, uh, it doesn't matter what his name is, but he was co-consul in the year 376 BCE. And one day, Fabian number one was at her house her sister, the younger sister, Fabia number two, was there. The two of them were sitting in the atrium talking when all of a sudden uh, the lictor, and you guys remember the lictor is like a bodyguard. We talked about them with uh, being bodyguards for dictators, but they became bodyguards for all Roman politicians who held what's called imperium or, or the power to control an army, essentially. And so um, the co-consul, Fabian number one's husband had several lictors assigned to protect him. And the lictors, if you'll recall, carried the fasces, which is the bundle of rods with the axe. Well, the lictor came along and he did as is customary. He took his fasces and he banged on the door three times really loudly, the front door. And that was the signal that he was there to accompany Fabian number one's husband, the co-consul from his house down to the forum for the day's business. Well, Fabian number two did not know that custom. And when the banging on the door occurred, she jumped and got freaked out. Now, Fabian number one laughed at her younger sister and sort of said in a condescending way, oh, this is something that you'll never have to worry about because you married a plebeian and we know he's never going to be co-consul. Ha ha ha. Well, this makes Fabian number two a little bit upset. So later on that day, Ambustus, the dad, uh, sees Fabian number two in the garden and she looks sad and they have a conversation and he says to me, what's going on? What's wrong? And she tells him about what happened earlier in the day and she tells him that she feels like she married beneath her social status and she's upset at the fact that her husband, even though he's a pretty stand-up guy, he could never become co-consul because of the nature of his birth, that he's a plebeian. And so Ambustus, the dad, being a pretty good guy, he comforted, comforted her by saying that honor would come to both of their households. That he just needed a little bit of time to figure out a way. So Ambustus, along with Gaius Licinius Stolo, and along with another ambitious pleb, this guy right here, Lucius Sextius, uh, they come up with roughly this plan. So in the year 376, um, Licinius and Sextius are elected tribunes of the plebs, and the two of them propose uh, these three pieces of legislation, which eventually all get tied together into one bill. Um, here's number one. The debt should be paid off in three annual installments and not all at once. So if you borrow money from somebody, you've got, you know, uh, some space to pay it back. Uh, number two, that nobody can possess more than 500 acres of land. And then finally, number three, and here's the big one. One of each year's co-consuls had to be a plebeian and not a patrician. Well, of course, there was a, a massive amount of opposition to this, but Licinius and Sextius 
continue to run for re-election as tribunes of the plebs every year for 10 straight years. And each year, they kept pushing this bill. Now, for his part, Ambustus, who was a patrician senator, started talking kind of behind the scenes to the other senators. And finally, after 10 years, was able to get enough of them on board. The bill passed, and sure enough, uh, Sextius of the pair there became the first elected plebeian consul. Now, there were some diehard senators who just absolutely refused to ratify the election. And so the plebs then threatened to have another secession, and the senators declare a state of emergency, and they pull out of retirement, they're fond of doing this, an old man at this point to become dictator. And that old man is none other than Camillus, the guy who defeated Veii and then supposedly helped rebuild Rome. And uh, Camillus came in, looked at the situation, gathered the patricians together and said, hey, look, you just need to accept this and just move on. And so the crisis was averted and boom, we have fundamentally made a change to the law. And so plebeians must be represented at the very top of Roman government from that point forward. Now, uh, interestingly, it'll be a while before both co-consuls in a year are plebeian, but we uh, will get there. Now, right after this bill passes, uh, in the years 366 all the way to 363, three years in a row, a massive plague breaks out. Oh, timely, huh? Now, actually, the plague, one of the first victims of the plague is none other than Camillus himself. Um, hundreds and hundreds of other Romans uh, perish in this plague. We don't exactly know what it was, probably smallpox or measles, something like that, something that's very treatable today um, if you are vaccinated. But uh, the Romans were at a loss, and so they went to oracles, and they c consulted the Sibylline books, and they tried to figure out what to do. And they came up with three solutions. Here's the first. The first solution is called a lectisternium. It's where every single Roman who had a house essentially took a couch outside, put a drape on the couch, and then put images of gods and goddesses on the couch, and then actually took food and served it to them. And these couches are all out in the streets. And so they did this. Of course, they all go inside. And uh, we all know, of course, that people who are hungry came and took all the food and ate it. But when the Romans came out the next day, it appeared that all the food was gone. And so they said, ha, ah, the gods have feasted. Surely the plague will go away. Well, it didn't. So then the oracle, the next oracle that they went to said, oh, you want this plague to go away? I know what you have to do. You guys, you Romans who seem to detest anything that's artistic, you need to introduce plays and drama and theater. And so the Romans send some ambassadors over to Greece to observe how they did it. And they came back and they built a temporary wooden grandstand in the middle of the Roman Forum. And they actually put on their first play. And they kind of enjoyed it. But hello. When you gather a whole bunch of people together during a plague, it's not a good idea. Social distancing is a good thing. And sure enough, the plague spread even more widely because of this. So now we are up to thousands of people who have died. And finally, the Romans did one last thing to help get rid of the plague, what they think will. There was this vague memory of a plague going away in years past when a dictator hammered a nail into a wooden tablet on the side of the temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus on the Ides of September. So, in the year 363 BCE, the Romans decide to do just that. They appoint this man right here, Lucius Manlius Imperiosus. Notice how his first name is not Marcus in Marcus Manlius Capitolinus, because we can't use that name anymore. Lucius Manlius Imperiosus. They appoint him dictator, and he's only supposed to be dictator for five minutes. He's supposed to take the hammer, take the nail, and hammer in that nail on the side of the wall of the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus on that one day, the Ides of September. He's immediately supposed to resign the dictatorship, and boom, the plague's supposed to go away. But they appoint him dictator, they give him the hammer and the nail, and he says, no, I'm not doing that. And you appointed me dictator now, so you have to do what I tell you to. Do you know why this plague won't go away? Because we are a bunch of wimps now. We need to call a draft. We need to get an army together. And we need to go fight instead, because we're Romans and that's what we do. Well, the tribunes of the plebs 
to their credit, rose up in revolt and said, oh, heck no, this ain't happening. And we have a situation where Lucius Manlius Imperiosus, even though he is, I mean, look at his last name, Imperiosus, even though he is the dictator, he resigns. And then one of those tribunes of the plebs, a man by the name of Marcus Pomponius, decided to bring Imperiosus up on trial. Why? Two reasons. Number one, cruelty when he was drafting all of the troops together. Of course, the Roman, the troops didn't actually go out and fight anybody because the tribunes intervened. And then secondly, cruelty for how he treated his own son. He dragged Manlius' son into this uh, trial. Manlius' son was named Titus Manlius. And why was Lucius the dad so mean to Titus the son? Because Titus had a speech impediment and people just assumed that he was dumb. Um, in fact, Lucius had kicked his son Titus out of the house, banished him from the city, and made him go work uh, on somebody's farm, essentially as an indentured servant, simply because Lucius felt embarrassed by his son Titus's speech impediment. And Marcus Pomponius, a tribune of the plebs, he just adds that, that tr uh, charge in just for good measure. Okay, now, Titus, however, this is something important to understand about Romans, Titus Manlius, was loyal to his dad, and he wanted to show everybody that he would be that he would rather be loyal to a bad father than to be loyal to his father's enemies. So as the trial is approaching, early one morning, Titus gets permission from the farmer, where he's an indentured servant, to leave for the day. And Titus comes to the city, and he seeks an audience with Pomponius at Pomponius's house. Now, Pomponius sends word down Yes, let him in. Please, please. I bet he's got some good information. He's going to give me lots of bad stuff about his dad right before the trial. And so Pomponius uh, invites Titus Manlius to come see him in the back room. And when Titus Manlius comes in, what does he do? He takes a knife. Whoosh, it's hard to see right there. A dagger hidden in his toga. And here it's, uh, well, an interesting picture. I'm not exactly sure what's going on. Like, what is up with this? But anyway, takes a knife and charges at Pomponius and holds it up to his throat and says, I need you to go right outside. And I need you to declare to everybody that there will be no more trial for my father or else I'm going to kill you right now. And so Pomponius, kind of freaked out, agrees, goes right outside his house and announces to all who are gathered that there will be no more trial. And the plebeians were at first upset, but then word spread about what Titus had done, and the plebeians, even though they wanted to see his father put on trial for the way that he treated them when he was trying to draft the soldiers, they had a begrudging respect for the son. And they were like, you know what? That's pretty cool. He's loyal. We can respect that. Now keep Titus tucked away. Titus Manlius is going to become a pretty big freaking deal. Now, that very same year that all this is going on, very strange story, a massive crack, a chasm opens up. There's an earthquake and a huge chasm opens up in the middle of the forum. And the Romans were like, what should we do? We got to fill this up. And they tried filling it with dirt and big stones at first, and that didn't work at all. So finally they go consult an oracle, of course, and they say, hey, uh, well, what do we fill this chasm with to make it go away? It's in the middle of the forum. It's, it's kind of a pain. And the oracle says, you must fill the chasm with the chief strength of the Roman people. And the Romans really puzzle over this. What does that mean? I don't understand. And so they take some gold and silver and precious metals and they throw it into the chasm. And what happens? Nothing. It just falls out of sight. So then they're like, well, I don't know. What should we do? Uh, we should take some other things that were good. We're good engineers. Let's take some building materials. They take building materials and grains and all kinds of things. They throw it in. And what happens? Nothing. So then, finally, last but not least, Marcus Curtius, who is a young man, a young patrician man, he comes to the rescue and he says, you fools, I know what Rome's chief strength is. It's arms and courage and valor. And then he hops on his horse and he jumps into the chasm. And as he jumps into the chasm, sure enough, the chasm closes up. And there's a small little indention uh, that's in the still in the forum. And when it would rain from that point forward, it would pool into a small lake uh, in that part of the forum where the chasm closed up. 
And from that point forward, it was called Lacus Curtius, or the Lake of Curtius. But here he is, Marcus Curtius. Uh, I love this image in particular. He's like, oh, as he jumps straight into the chasm. Why is the chasm on fire? I have no idea. But pretty awesome and epic story. Um, and that is our story time today. Next time on story time. Oh, boy. Uh, Titus Manlius gets an interesting nickname. It deals with two chains. And we're going to fight a whole bunch of wars. Okay, goodbye.